Hi folks, welcome to part three of using your map and compass. This is the final part in this little series. In part one we looked at taking a bearing and accounting for magnetic variation. In part two we looked at pacing and timing techniques and in this part here we're going to be looking at what to do when you get lost because it's going to happen sooner or later. So uh, welcome to the Camping Astronomer channel and we're now going to climb up the hill on the South Downs that's behind me here. So I'll pick you up a bit later on. My name's John and I make videos on camping, astronomy and walking. If you like what you see in this video then please check my channel out as there may be others that interest you there. But in the meantime, let's crack on with today's video. So here we are at a hill just outside Lewis called Mount Caban and it's an Iron Age uh, fort basically. Hi folks, quick interruption by editing me. Uh, as you can tell, it was an absolute howling gale on the top of the hill yesterday. Uh, luckily for me, I was wearing one of these Lavalier type mics, so you can still hear me talking okay, but um, apologies in advance for the um, howling gale going on in the background. And now time to get back to the video. These are the ramparts of the fort. Well, I actually know exactly where I am, obviously, um, but for the sake of argument, let's pretend we're lost. So the first thing to do before you do anything else, really, um, is to sit down and have a cup of coffee for 10 minutes and have a little think about where you might be and what you're going to do. And it's really windy on the top of this hill here, but there's a load of little depressions that I suspect are from where people were excavating it so um, I've dived down into one of those looks like a little shell hole at the end of the day to get me out the wind so uh, a cup of tea time so having had a little think um, the chances are when you're lost you really more or less know where you are you you'll know like within a kilometer square where you are um, and the idea is to try and hone that down a bit so what we're going to do now is um, stick our head up above this little depression into the wind and try and find three landmarks that I can see that surround me that I can identify on the map so over there is a junction of two rivers and I can take a bearing off that by pointing the direction of travel arrow at that river junction and then rotating the bezel of the compass so that the red housing arrow intersects with the red needle on the, the red magnetic needle. So that's given us a bearing of 210 degrees to that little junction in the rivers. And at the moment, we don't have to worry about magnetic variation here. So there's that river junction on the map. And what we want to do is transfer our compass bearing onto the map. As I say, we don't have to worry about magnetic variation here in the UK at the moment because it's a degree or so. Um, but if you did have to worry about it and the variation is west of grid north, then you subtract it from your compass bearing. And if the magnetic variation is east of grid north, then you add it. But we don't have to do anything. We can just take my bearing. So what we want to do now is to use the point we took the bearing on as a pivot point so we put our compass on that point and simply rotate it around
until the compass housing lines are parallel with the grid lines on the map which is about there and then we draw a line from the point of interest that we took the bearing from towards in the general direction of where we're sitting. So the other thing I can see from here is um, like a chalk cutting along which on one side of it a bit of a railway line runs so that's something else that I can take a bearing off of so I've pointed the direction of travel arrow towards the chalk cutting and then rotated the bezel so that the red north magnetic arrow or magnetic needle sits in the housing red arrow I've put the red in the shed if you remember from one of my earlier videos and I've got my bearing of 100 degrees basically so we now need to transfer that onto the mat so here's the chalk pit on the mat and that's where the little chalk face intersects the railway line so as before the idea is to use the point you took the bearing of, off of as a pivot point and align the housing arrows here with the north-south grid line so they're parallel which I've now pretty well got there and then basically draw a line along that edge of the compass So where those two lines intersect in theory is where you are but as you've seen and I've deliberately picked a not particularly nice day today um, it's quite tricky taking these bearings in the wind it'd be worse if it was raining so we don't know for sure that we're at that point because there's an error associated with taking the bearings um, none of us is perfect so what we need to do really is to take a, a third bearing if we can and that will create a little triangle where everything intersects my third bearing is going to be glind place down there so the glind place bearing is 70 degrees so we'll go and put that on the map now So we use glind place as our pivot point to rotate the compass round and try and get the uh, compass housing lines parallel with the grid, grid north lines. Which looks like about there. And then draw our third line in. This little triangle that's formed here is called the triangle of uncertainty and you know you're sitting in there. Um, I've been fairly lucky this time round in that it's quite a small triangle, it doesn't always work that way. Um, so I suspect within about 50 metres I actually uh, have more or less got it about right. But it, it can be a bit bigger than this. But nonetheless, that's not too bad. Well all this is all well and good but of course I've actually been able to see a reasonable distance in order to pick points to take bearings from and do my uh, little triangle of uncertainty on the map um, but what happens if it's misty you can't see a blinking thing and you're lost and then of course um, it's quite limited with what you can do and this is the reason why I have apps on my phone and I have a, a GPS device so if it gets really uh, dodgy I can identify where I am. I carry a GPS device, we'll have a look at it in a minute, 
that I only ever use for cross-checking my position, so um, I'm not going to run out of battery and stuff. And it also means that I don't have to use my phone. But um, we'll look at both my GPS device and my phone now. So my GPS is a SatMap Active 20, and it's got loaded on it one to 25,000 ordnance survey map for the whole of the UK. So this tells me precisely what my position is, and it's using the OS map. So I can take that and um, easily cross-reference it. I'll make the light go out quick because it saves the battery. I can easily cross-reference it to my map. Um, but if you make note of that position there, we'll compare it with my map. And I reckon I'm actually just slightly south of where I calculated that I would be, but only by a few metres, basically, not very far at all. Um, so it's, it's easy to check your position using that sat map, map active thing and um, put it on the map. If you're not able to do this, uh, creating a triangle of, of uncertainty thing, uh, but not everybody, of course, has got a dedicated GPS device, and in those instances, a phone app is a really good idea. And I tend to use one called Osmand, O S M A N D, and I'll just fire that up and show you a couple of screenshots. So this is the Osmond app then. Um, I found it quite accurate. It's got all the footpaths marked on it and it shows your position and the direction that you're traveling in. So um, yeah, it's a good app I reckon. So if you're really, really lost and you haven't got an app on your phone or you've got no signal or your battery's gone flat or something and you haven't got a GPS device and it's misty and you can't take any back bearings, then the best things to do there, if possible, try and retrace your steps to the last place you knew where you were, but that might be easier said than done if it's all claggy and horrible. Um, failing that, your best bet really is just to head down. You need to get downhill. Uh, the lower down you can get, the more sheltered it will be, the warmer it will be. Uh, maybe you follow a stream or something like that. It's, got to be a bit careful you don't walk off any cliff edges. The streams sometimes take quite um, steep routes down, but that's your best bet. But hopefully you won't end up in that situation. It is actually unlikely that you've got absolutely no idea of where you are. If you keep ticking features off on your map as you're walking, then it means that you're never too far away from where you last were when you knew exactly where you were. Uh, but yeah, I hope that you, you know you don't end up in that sort of situation. I'm now going to navigate to a point where I know exactly where I am. I'm just going to pretend that I didn't have my GPS with me. I know where I am within my little triangle of error. And in fact, my triangle of error is quite narrow, so I know pretty well where I am uh, without worrying. But um, if you, your triangle comes out to be quite large, and that can happen if the weather's horrible, it's you know much worse than it is today, taking the bearings will be much less accurate, and you'll end up with a, a much bigger triangle of error. So what you want to do is to navigate from some point in that triangle of error to a known point. Now, because you don't know exactly where you are within that triangle, what you actually do is something called aiming off, in that you don't navigate exactly to the point that you want to get to, you navigate to a point to one side of it, so that it, any errors associated with your bearing are inconsequential. So we'll have a look to see how that, that works out on the map. Okay. So I'm here, now my little triangle of error is actually quite small, but let's pretend it was much bigger. And really, I just want to get to somewhere where I know exactly where I am. And this point here is where a path goes through a wall or a fence or something, so there'll be a gate or something like that. So that's what I want to get to. 
Now, if I was to take a bearing straight to that, and I don't know exactly where I am here, I could miss that point completely. So what you basically do is you take a bearing to a point to one side of this known feature. So I'm just going to try and intersect this path somewhere here. And I know that when I get to that path, I've got to turn right. Because I know which side of that wall, wall or fence that I'm on. And then when I get there, I know precisely where I am. So I just need to take a bearing to some point here somewhere. So I'm actually going to navigate to some point here a little bit away from the, the known point. So I just have to take a bearing based on that. And it doesn't have to be super accurate. So I've got a bearing of about 40 degrees. And that gives me my direction of travel. So off I go. So in theory, at, at this point here, I could use um, the pacing techniques or I could use Naismith's rule, something like that, just to give me a feeling of when I should intersect the footpath that I'm interested in hitting and then turn in right on that path. But today I'm not going to bother. Visibility is good, so there's no, no problems. So this is the path. Kind of not really a path, it's just a bit, bit of trampled down grass, but um, anyway, this is it. So I know I've got to turn right on this and head down the hill until I intersect a, a fence or a gate or something. So that's where we'll go now. So here's the gate, and that means that I now know exactly where I am. I'm at this point here having come down this path. So that technique called aiming off is quite good because it means you don't have to take a super accurate bearing to get to a known point. You can sort of be off by a bit and uh, still find where you want to get to. So I now know where I am and I'm just going to trot off down this path into the village and the car park. That's me back at the car now. Uh, nice day out. I hope you found that video a bit useful and the other two in this series as well. Um, it's pretty windy on the top there, like it's only about 500 feet or something, or even less than that probably. But absolute howling gale, it does make it quite difficult to do this map and compass work when it's that windy, because your map keeps blowing all over the place. So hopefully what we've seen today you won't have to do too often, but it's worth having an idea of how to do it. It's windy down here even. <laughs> It's worth having an idea of how to do it so that um, if you do ever need to, you can actually do so. Uh, but anyway, on that note, I shall close this video now, bid you cheerio, and see you next time. Take care.